Hi. Hi, and thank you for joining our educational webinar with Dr. Antonio Abate and Dr. Kerr Shaw, who will discuss the latest evidence-based research on the risks COVID-19 has had on those with heart conditions, as well as how the virus has affected heart health. I'm Pauline Jankowski, VCU Health Poly Heart Center Marketing and Communications Manager. Before we begin the presentation, I would first like to make note that we will hold all questions until the end. Please feel free to drop any questions you may have in the Facebook comment section throughout the event, and we will address them during the Q&A portion. And now a bit about our speakers. Dr. Abate, a native of Italy, is a renowned physician who is a recipient of numerous awards and honors and has also authored and co-authored over 350 articles, reviews, and editorials in professional medical journals. Dr. Abate joined Poly Heart Center in 2007 and today is the medical director of the Clinical Research Unit at VCU Health and an associate director at the C. Kenneth and Diane Wright Center for Clinical and Translational Research. The Clinical Research Unit is a unique dedicated space at VCU Health used for clinical trials and has a committed staff of nurses and has been specifically heavily involved in the COVID-19 cl clinical trials. Dr. Shaw earned his medical degree from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and completed both his residency in internal medicine and fellowship in cardiology at the University of Maryland. Dr. Shaw joined the Poly Heart Center in 2009 and is the Section Chief of Heart Failure. He specializes in seeing patients with heart failure, cardiomyopathies, and those who may want to consider heart transplant or heart assist devices. Additionally, he has a niche for treating patients with cardiac amyloidiosis. Thank you, Dr. Abate and Dr. Shaw for joining us today. I will now turn the show over to Dr. Abate. Thank you very much, uh, Pauline. Uh, you know, excited to be doing this. Uh, it's a kind of a, a, a different way to communicate that we're experiencing in the past year uh, using uh, Zoom or similar platforms. Uh, today is a kind of a different day as well. It's kind of a snow day. And so I'm uh, actually working from my home office. And so, um, it, you know, a different way to communicate, but still excited to be uh, together with our friends and share what we have learned in the past uh, year. It has been a difficult year. There's been a lot of information coming at us. And uh, um, I, you know, we're here to share some of what we've learned and uh, remind you that uh, there's always more and more to learn. Uh, excited also to be here with my good friend, uh, Kea Yersha. Uh, so let me go to the next slide here. And uh, um, I think here, and you know, I just put together some kind of simple schematics to, um, go over what is COVID-19 and, you know, I, I, I expect someone's going to say, you know, this 19 should probably go away as we're in the 21 at this point. But uh, COVID-19 refers to the disease that is caused by a specific virus that has a name. It's called novel coronavirus 2019. It's also called SARS-CoV-2 because it's very anal analogous to the SARS virus that we have experienced some time ago. Uh, it is a coronavirus, a virus that uh, we are used to dealing with, mostly for common cold or for bronchitis, but upper respiratory infection. So this is not really new. What may be characteristic about this virus is this is spike protein, and we'll talk about it more, and, uh, and that may be uh, important in triggering a particular uh, inflammatory response that can be uh, dangerous to patients. What is also uh, different about this virus is that uh, you know, these virus mutate a lot, and at some point in the genesis of this virus, it mutated to the point that uh, humans did not have antibodies, did not, were not able to recognize this uh, virus at all. And so we're all, um, you know, susceptible to be infected by this virus. Uh, what we have learned uh, is that COVID-19 is an incredibly heterogeneous disease. Uh, when, they, when we first heard about COVID-19, we heard about the most critical cases, the one that were in the hospital on the ventilator, and many of them dying. Um, I guess it is good news and better news that the majority of patients don't 
uh, experience that critical illness. They don't die. And, uh, uh, and, and so it is reassuring in my way, in some ways. It is also, however, challenging because in such an heterogeneous disease, sometimes recognizing the individuals that have infection has been challenging. And we've also recognized that uh, individuals can be infected with this virus, can be spreading this virus and have no symptoms at all. And, and this has uh, been a particularly challenge to keep the, the infections contained. Um, here, I kind of uh, um, divided the COVID-19 in phases just to give an idea of what, to, what someone may experience or may expect. Uh, there is a pre-symptomatic phase uh, where the individual clearly has the virus and clearly can infect either others, but we don't know how long this e exactly lasts, and we don't know how many uh, progress to the next phase because there's really no way to know how many have been infected unless we randomly tested the population continuously. And so this is one of the unanswered questions, but we know that these exist. Um, what we are more commonly encountering in our practice is the patients that have this milder version of the disease that is driven by the viral response. This virus, it's in the upper airway, in the nose, in the, in the throat, in the bronchi, in the lungs here. And uh, uh, patients experience what is actually rather mild bronchitis. Uh, it can last three to seven days. Fever is usually mild. And uh, uh, most of the people are not particularly concerned. They now know to be tested because they know they may be infecting others. But otherwise, I suspect in the earlier phase, many would just deal with this at home with no problem. And unfortunately, some, and the exact number, we don't know how many, but somewhere between 5 and 20%, transition to the more advanced and serious phases that are not driven by the virus anymore. They're driven by an excessive, exaggerated inflammatory response of our own body. This usually happens around seven to 10 days after someone has been infected, but it can be difficult to keep track of time. And patients now experience a more uh, higher and persistent fever. They feel sick, very tired. They can have shortness of breath, and often they need to use oxygen therapy. And this can be going on for several weeks. Uh, unfortunately, a small group of patients experiences a very aggressive form that is referred to acute respiratory distress syndrome, where the lungs are all now invaded by this inflammatory process. The oxygenation is critically low. Patients need more advanced way to support the oxygen with a special masks or some with them being on a mechanical ventilation. Uh, and unfortunately, this can lead to death. And this is what, uh, what we've learned that thankfully the majority of patients don't progress to these phases, but some can. And what I think it's very important uh, for the audience tonight, for this group that I'm, I'm, I'm talking to, is that patients with heart disease are at higher risk for the severe and critical forms of COVID-19. There's no reason to think that someone with heart disease would be more likely to get infected with the virus. There's no reason to think that the viral progression would be more pronounced. However, heart failure patients and patients with other heart diseases, and I think Kayer is gonna tell us more about this, have, are predisposed to have an overly exaggerated inflammatory response that can put them into a severe or critical form of COVID-19. Um, I would like to tell you a little bit, what do we do for patients nowadays? I have to say, it has been an incredible journey. In the past year, there's been hundreds of clinical trials and we now have effective treatments for COVID-19. They may not eliminate the risk, but they reduce it significantly. And you have to think the way that I think about how to treat this, I think about phases of the disease and uh, strategies to treat the patient. So the first phase is really driven by this virus that uses the spike protein to attack the cells in the lungs or in the airways. 
and it can give uh, in, in re upper respiratory infection or sometimes also a lower respiratory infection, but mostly upy, upper, that is driven by the virus itself. So strategies here would be those that are targeting the virus. And obviously COVID-19 vaccines are the best ways for prevention. They're not good for treatment, but they may be very effective for preventive and we, we should be all vaccinated. I've been vaccinated already in uh, uh, end of December and January. And patients with heart disease should be lining up to get vaccinated right now because of their risk of more severe forms of, uh, uh, of the disease. Uh, there are monoclonal antibodies that have received emergency utilization authorization from the FDA. These, what they do is they simulate in some way the vaccine and they will, uh, these antibodies are given to patients that are very high risk and they target the virus and reduce the virus circulating and can prevent the more uh, aggressive forms of the COVID-19. Here at VCU, we're using it for the most vulnerable patients like those with transplant, heart transplantation, the other form of transplant, they may have trouble making their own antibodies. Remdesivir, you must have heard about this, is the actually first FDA approved drug this drug interferes with the viral replication and it works by reducing the duration of the viral illness, therefore preventing in some way the secondary wave of injury. And it's only approved to be used in the hospital. Convalescent plasma is also being used a lot in the past several months. We've learned now that if we use the high uh, intensity or high um, titer of this convalescent plasma, and especially if we give it early, it may help uh, reduce the length of the disease and therefore it's another weapon. As I mentioned early, the viral injury is only part of the, of the problem. The actual major issue, the catastrophic events that could occur are due to inflammation. And uh, in June of last year, a trial came out from uh, England first and then confirmed from other trials that using a commonly uh, um, used anti-inflammatory drug, a steroid, dexamethasone, that's already FDA approved for other indication, can reduce the severity of the disease and keep patients alive. And so it's now standard of care for this. A separate uh, anti-inflammatory drug, baricitinib, that has already been used for other anti-inflammatory drug was tested and also showed benefit but it was not tested in patients receiving dexamethasone and therefore we don't use it unless patients for some reason cannot receive dexamethasone, which is pretty rare. A third drug, tocilizumab, is a very powerful anti-inflammatory drug that is reserved for patients with rheumatoid arthritis or other severe inflammatory reaction to uh, drugs used for chemotherapy and has shown that it can help patients with very aggressive forms of pneumonia. It can help them prevent them to get on the ventilator and can help them uh, keep them alive. And so we use it for that, uh, those patients. Uh, there's a third problem that we see in patients with COVID-19 is the forming clots. We know that this virus can injure the vasculature. And when we injure the vasculature, uh, there is an increased risk of clot. These clots can happen in the legs, in the lungs, in the heart, in the brain. And so patients that are in the hospital uh, with a severe enough uh, COVID to be hospitalized need to be anticoagulated with one of the forms of anticoagulants that are already approved. These are not special drugs. The intensity of how we anticoagulate, we're still learning right now. We, there's two, two intensity level prophylaxis and full dose treatment. And we can agree today that everybody needs at least prophylaxis in some cases full dose treatment may be even better. Um, why is uh, this important for patients with heart disease? I think, you know, Kayer is going to tell us a little bit more about this, but I think that we need to understand that the heart is sensitive to events going on in the body. And so patients that are have heart disease are somewhat predisposed to a more severe form because of their underlying predisposition to inflammation. COVID-19, like any other viral illness, like influenza, can exacerbate the heart disease, make it flare up, make it worse. And so that could be a, a problem itself. Uh, however, COVID-19 can also form new injury. This injury can be based from the inflammation deriving from the virus, new blood clots, 
new arrhythmias, especially atrial fibrillation. So new problems can happen even in those without heart disease before, but those with pre-existing heart disease are going to be somewhat predisposed to have these complications. And therefore, uh, patients with heart disease uh, or that are at risk for heart disease should be followed closely for possible complications if they're having this and absolutely should be signing up for a COVID vaccine as early as possible uh, to prevent it from uh, happening. And this, of course, is on top of uh, mask wearing, uh, social distancing, hand hygiene, all other strategies that are proven to reduce the spread of infection like COVID-19, but also influenza and other viruses. And I think with this, I'm going to hand uh, it over to my good friend, uh, Kayer, to tell us about, uh, especially in the heart failure population. Thank you, Kayer. Thank you, Antonio. And uh, thank you, Pauline, for the introduction. I think as the audience is realizing, Antonio is an absolute expert on the topic of COVID-19 and the treatments for it. And he's conducted and participated in a variety of studies here at VCU on the topic. As Pauline mentioned in the introduction, I'm a cardiologist that focuses on the care of patients with cardiomyopathies or that may need heart transplantation or have heart failure. This is a particularly vulnerable population and I want to give an overview in the next 10 or 15 minutes on um, the risk associated with heart failure and COVID-19 infection. And then also touch on some of the conversations that have been taking place related to ethnic minorities and disparities in outcomes related to COVID-19, particularly on why um, uh, the, 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 conversa the topic has been related to patients with cardiovascular disease and heart failure. So in, in my world, on a day-to-day -day basis, I deal with patients who have cardiomyopathies or heart disease uh, or heart muscle disease. And here on the screen, I'm showing you a, a single slice of an MRI image of someone with a normal heart. My mouse cursor here is over the main pumping chamber, the left ventricle. And I want you to focus on that. This is a muscle that's squeezing appropriately, ejecting the blood out. The, the blood in this type of image is the bright white colored um, uh, substance. Now, if patients develop a cardiomyopathy, or dysfunction of their heart muscle. It comes in a variety of flavors. And I'm just going to describe the two common ones broadly. The first is when the heart becomes weak, and sometimes this is associated with dilation. Now I've shown you an example of this in the middle of the screen here. And what you see is, is, is a dilated left ventricle, so much larger than the one on the left. And also, a decrease in amount of squeeze of the heart or the percentage of this white substance or blood being ejected with each beat is decreased. Common causes of weakening and dilation of the heart include coronary disease or blockages in your arteries. Diabetes can contribute to it, high blood pressure. Some of these can occur by chance, bad luck with viruses or are hereditary and can be related to toxins like excessive alcohol use can be related to other systemic diseases. The list is very long, um, but the point is you're left with a heart that's weakened and is not able to serve its primary function. And we'll get into that in a second. Patients can also have cardiomyopathies that look different than that, that are may have normal pumping function, but the walls are very thickened and restricted we call these non-compliant walls. The heart cannot accommodate very much blood flow and it may look like this. Now this is an extreme case just to help people see what I'm talking about, but this is a left ventricle here on the right that's very thickened. The, the, the dark area or the heart muscle here is very thickened and, and it makes it difficult for this type of heart um, which has increased left ventricular hypertrophy, we call it, or wall thickening to accommodate large amounts of blood flow as a normal heart on the left would here. So these patients can develop this disease from long-standing high blood pressure, kidney disease, or kidney failure. Both of these diseases can be related to obesity. 
In addition, these can also be hereditary and, uh, and a result of, as I mentioned before, just bad luck. So imagine that. So patients who have a cardiomyopathy can develop a syndrome we describe as heart failure. This is what happens when you have a, a heart with underlying disease, as I've shown you, and you're unable to meet the oxygen demands of your body. So the pump is not functioning well. It's unable to deliver vital nutrients and oxygen to your organs, and you can develop symptoms of low cardiac output. These patients may complain of fatigue, exercise intolerance, may develop kidney or liver injury over time. They may have a poor appetite and very low blood pressures. Also, patients can develop congestion where there's backup of blood flow, collection of fluid, shortness of breath. Over time, uh, the hallmark of all of this is patients may be okay at rest, but cannot tolerate increases in demands on the body or the heart, say associated with exercise or stress. They may become decompensated and go into worsening organ failure. So this is the essence of, of heart failure, is, is all of these patients walk a thin line before they become unstable. An instability that could lead to arrhythmias, low blood pressure, end organ injury, and death. So a very fragile population in some senses, but a very prevalent disease. Now, if we start talking about the overlap and the discussion of patients with cardiomyopathies or weakening of the heart and really heart disease in general with COVID, the topic that uh, Dr. Abate was alluding to, we start seeing statistics being published that are somewhat startling. Um, while the overall population does generally well, heart failure patients represent a very high risk group of COVID-19 infections. There are publications out there, and I'm not going to inundate you with the data, but that suggests that if you have a cardiomyopathy and heart failure, and you're admitted to the hospital with a COVID-19 infection, you have a one in five, four chance of dying during that admission. Some reports say even up to 40%, and that was more early in the crisis where uh, only severe cases were being identified. So I, the reason we become worried when someone has a compromised heart goes back to the root of what a cardiomyopathy is and the stress that the illness puts on the body that Dr. Abate described. This is an acute inflammatory condition where everything is revved up in your body. And if you get to the severe forms where there's quite a bit of inflammation, where there's potentially fluxes and volume or fluid in your blood, it is very easy for these uh, cardiomyopathies to become decompensated. And, and the decompensated heart then further contributes to the ongoing illness and damage and, and really amplifies what maybe someone with a normal heart would tolerate without issue or concern. On top of this, and I'm going to focus on this a little bit because I think this is going to be in some of the messaging later on when, when we open this up for discussion. On top of this, um, the pandemic itself has, has led to decreasing visitations and utilization of healthcare um, resources. So here, on this figure right now, I'm showing a line graph over time that's describing the number of hospitalizations throughout before and then throughout the pandemic uh, for coronary disease, which is in blue, and that we're talking about chest pain and heart attacks, and heart failure, the topic I've been discussing in red. Now, now mind you, these are two huge categories of utilizers of healthcare resources during non-pandemic times. Um, and what's happened is when the first surge occurred, looking here into this date, uh, spring of 2020, and th this is a hospital in the United Kingdom here, and, but there are graphs like this similar to others 
um, other health systems throughout the world. Uh, what you see here is, as we approach the surge, the first surge, patients stopped coming to the hospital for chest pain, for coronary events, and for heart failure exacerbations. Uh, and I'm sure we all personally recall that time. It was a period of great uncertainty and fear. And what happened here, and, and I'll just point out here at the right side of the graph where the, my mouse marker is, you're seeing another decline occurring now with the second surge. So people are not using or visiting healthcare resources. What we observed during the first surge, and the data came out months later, what we observed where with this reduced utilization of healthcare resources for heart failure and coronary disease, there was an increase in patients who died of heart attacks, an increase of patients who had out of hospital cardiac arrest. Typically it's when the heart stops and it's typically related to a weakened heart or um, a, a blockage of blood flow in the heart or a heart attack. Out of hospital cardiac arrest, many, an, a, a large number of increase of in-home cardiac arrest and decreased utilization of standby CPR administration, meaning someone is nearby to perform CPR. So increasing mortality, decreasing utilization of resources, and, um, uh, overlapping at the time of both, well, the first surge. We'll see what the consequence of this is. So in addition to um, all of the medical components of having heart disease, patients stopped visiting and obtaining care. Uh, and, and these are symptomatic. There was a steep decline in routine care also. And we'll come back to this a little bit in, uh, in the conversation piece. So that's a little overview of heart failure. Now I wanna spend a minute talking about the impact on ethnic minorities. Um, on the screen here, I have CDC data about the frequency of diagnosis, hospitalization rates, and mortality rates related to COVID-19 infection. And this is, this is published online, and this, is, this was data accessed a few days ago that I'm sharing here from the CDC website. And I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a few observations and, and, and um, summary statements on this. Um, but I think I think everyone who's interested in the topic should should really look into it and think about um, some of the things that come up today because uh, the headlines sometimes can be misleading. Studies are coming out at a high frequency, and and there is a lot of information here and, and sometimes you know on topics that are that are controversial and uh, difficult to discuss without sitting down and reviewing all the data. What we have is. Um, on this table, these are comparisons of rate ratios uh, to a white population. So in the first column, you have American Indians um, and uh, Alaska Natives. The second column, uh, non-Hispanic Asians. The third col column, Black patients. And the fourth column, Hispanic patients. And what you see is in comparison to whites, Caucasians, you have a nearly three-time increase in hospitalization rates for blacks, nearly three-time increase in hospitalization rates for Hispanics, and almost twice the mortality rate for both of these populations, okay? And what we've learned in the last year is there is not a clear biologic explanation for this. There's not a clear ethnic specific explanation for why this would occur from a medical science standpoint. I think what we're, where the conversation is now, uh, what is going on here? Why there's such a disparity in outcomes by um, ethnic definition um, has, has really landed in two arenas, okay? So where does this risk come from? The first part of the conversation is risk of transmission. And I think what 
uh, available epidemiologic data, historical data, looking at this is, uh, and you know, r really social sciences is, we all know and we all discuss the fact that transmission is related to exposure. We, we advocate for wearing masks, socially distancing, minimizing uh, public interface. But what we also know is in these ethnic minority groups in, in blacks and Hispanics, there is a higher rate of multi-generation housing, culturally and related to uh, financial resources. We also know that a higher proportion of essential workers, people who have service jobs, people who are consumer facing and highly interacting, happen to be in these groups uh, of ethnic minorities or that they have a higher proportion of these jobs. Uh, there are discrepancies in poverty and healthcare access. Um, these all exist and potentially contribute to the increased rate of transmission and or prevention. The second conversation, excuse me, lies in the concept of the medical comorbidities. And there is a much higher prevalence of medical conditions such as diabetes and hypertension in the black and Hispanic population. These are key contributors to conditions such as coronary disease, heart failure as I've discussed, chronic kidney disease, stroke. All of these conditions have been discussed as risk factors for poor outcomes with COVID-19. What we do know from studies are we do see a higher rate of COVID-19 infection rel rel uh, um, compared to the population, and we see a higher rate of mortality compared to other races for Blacks and Hispanics. When you look at some of the scientific data and you say, okay, is this, if, if I adjust for the data and say, if I'm comparing patients of different races of eth um, to each other, but I make, sh and I adjust for the fact that they have, might have diabetes or hypertension. So if you compare Caucasian patients who have diabetes and hypertension and make them the same age, and then start comparing outcomes and give them both heart failure and compare outcomes with COVID-19, the power of race being a discriminatory factor, identifying patients at higher risk is diminished. Okay, so two different types of conversations taking place out there. One is we all acknowledge, everyone must acknowledge it, that there are uh, factors related to social inequalities and uh, contributing to transmission of the COVID-19 virus. There are factors specific to medical comorbidities that allow high-risk comorbidities to be in higher prevalence in Blacks and Hispanics, and that, that these factors, if present in any race, increase the risk of dying from COVID-19 when you have heart disease. So I'm gonna pause there and return the mic to Pauline and Antonio. Great. Very good, thank you. Uh, thank you both, um, Dr. Abate and Dr. Shaw for that informative uh, presentation. Um, we will now open the floor to any questions. Um, before I address the questions in the Facebook comments section, I would like to first read a few questions that were submitted in advance. So, uh, and Dr. Shaw, yeah, you were alluding to this one in one of your slides. Um, the statement in question, I know hospitals are seeking an increase in patients due to the virus. Should I still call 911 if I think I might be having a heart attack or stroke? Yes, please call 911. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Dr. Avate? Yes, I will, you know, I think Carrier made a strong argument there. And if I may, Carrier, I would say, you know, you, you clarified really well the, the disparities. And uh, I, I did have some of my uh, patients and, uh, um, and friends that sometimes 
consider themselves um, somewhat protected and immune because they were perhaps working from home and uh, um, you know not not as exposed. But I would say that it's important to understand that anybody can become infected and and that you know so everybody should be incredibly cautious in and again go get your vaccine and I'm sorry if I'm repeating this over and over again uh, but um, you know the, the the risk is widespread you know it's not in one pocket of, a, of a, the city it's all over and uh, you have to assume that any person could be carrying the virus because of that asymptomatic face that we talked about and and so just just to to state that this is um, everybody needs to be careful about this. And sorry if I'm going over some of the things again, but if you are sick, you got to call nine one one because if you don't, you're going to get worse. And then uh, and I also would like to reassure you that we are very careful in the hospital on protecting you and uh, uh, separating um, patients that could be infected or at risk. And from when, from as soon as you arrive on the emergency department, there are special tracks. And we, we are happy to take care of patients with COVID-19, but we're also happy of taking care, care of patients that don't have COVID-19 in a separate room, in a separate area, so that you don't get exposed. Yeah, that, and that, that's terrific. And it's important information to share and reshare and really just continuing educating ourselves and our um, friends and family uh, about this. So yeah, thank you both. Uh, okay, so the next question that we have queued up are, are symptoms of COVID-19 different for those who have heart-related conditions? Who would like to take that one? Um, you know, I think Antonio covered this uh, fairly fairly well and, and having underlying cardiovascular disease is is going to predispose you to a more severe phenotype but again um, it, it it's difficult to tease out because a lot of the data that we have kind of clumps the different heart diseases together um, we don't have the quality of information to, to really refine it and as cardiologists, we, all the patients we see have heart disease. Some are at a very later, more severe stage and earlier are in a preventive um, uh, sort of having risk factor stage. But that being said, I think I think it's fair and I'm comfortable uh, and, and I'd like to hear what Antonio has to say is if you have coronary disease or if you've been told you have heart failure, you for now are in a very high risk category if you are to get COVID-19. Yeah, no, I I think it, it, exactly what Kayer said. I mean, and, you know, it, there's no one size fits all. And so if you already have heart failure uh, at baseline, COVID-19 may make it worse. And so your heart failure symptoms may act up and that could be a sign of an infection. If you have mm -hmm. angina, that could, you know, uh, come up. And as we talked about it, the heart, the cardiac complications of COVID-19, new onset, they're not that common, thankfully. And they usually happen in people who have clear-cut COVID-19. So it's unlikely that someone is asymptomatic at home or has a mild form and has then a, a new heart complication. But it could happen. And so if you do have a new symptom, you need to get checked out. Yeah, very good. Thank you both. Okay. Really good answers, really good questions. Okay, so the next question is, um, can taking my heart disease medication put me at risk of, contra of contracting COVID-19? Dr. So, Bate, do you wanna take that? Or, or sorry, Karen? Either of us, I think we're gonna say mm -hmm. the same thing is no, not at all. And okay. you know, we never thought it would, and actually has been tested in clinical trials, and it, it's you know will not increase your risk, and uh, uh, and so you should absolutely continue to take all your medications, uh, you know, before. If you were to contact COVID nineteen, and if you were to get sick, I would encourage you to reach out to your heart doctor to see if any adjustments need to be made while you're sick is if you remember last time that you were sick with a, with a flu or something, you may not be drinking a lot of water. Um, you may be having maybe some problem with your intestines and you know, mm -hmm. having some loose stools. You may be uh, having fever and therefore you know, losing some water that way with sweat. 
And so your heart doctor may adjust your treatment, but I wouldn't do that without any guidance from the doctor. Okay. Okay. Anything know. to add, Care? No, absolutely not. I, that was, that kind of covers it. I would yeah. point out that conversely, if you stop your medications, bad things could happen. We know abruptly stopping heart failure medications can lead to a decompensation. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so please do not do not uh, self titrate without any guidance from your from your physician. Yeah, yeah, that's really important. And so, yeah, that that. This question um, could probably fall into that myth versus fact with, um, you know, it's a myth that this heart disease medication would put you at risk. So that would be a myth. Okay. So, um, all right. Another good question that uh, came in too with, um, with us being at home more often now, I worry about responding to emergencies. Is there a resource to learn, resource to learn CPR at home? Care, do you want to take that one? Yeah, no, this is great. Um, as I mentioned, uh, there have been an increase in the number of in-hospital cardiac arrest. Mm -hmm. And we, we, it's probably, you know, and I don't know if Antonio touched on this, it, it's probably less likely that COVID is directly affecting the heart, but people dying because of their pre-existing heart disease and maybe the stresses of COVID or not seeking medical care for usual symptoms. But that, that being said, um, I, I, I think the specific question is, is there a resource to learn CPR at home? And I do believe the American Heart Association has some online virtual training. Um, I don't know the accessibility for that as far as how to sign up, but the AHA.org site um, is, is very resourceful. Uh, you know, in person, the, the, for even, even providers pre-COVID, there were both virtual and in-person components. You will find instructions on hands-only CPR and if that's just the focus, uh, you know, until you get to get to a more comprehensive course, um, uh, the, the, you can extend mm -hmm. videos uh, and and American Heart Association um, documentation to support, you know, what, what you're watching. And, and, and if I may add to that, Pauline, uh, Pauline and uh, Kayer, yeah. there's a couple of things. One is, I think we heard this already from Kayer before, but let me say it again. You know, don't minimize your symptoms and call yeah. ahead, okay? Yeah. Unfortunately, emergencies can happen out of the blue, but mm -hmm. often they have some symptoms ahead of time. So don't hesitate to reach out to your doctor ahead of time, saying you're not feeling well. Don't, don't hesitate to call 911 early. Don't hesitate to come to the emergency department because, again, these events can be catastrophic. Um, call 911 early. If you're experiencing an emergency, call. If you're not sure, should I call or should I not call? Call because, as you said, there could be some delays and you don't mm -hmm. want that delay to add to your uh, outcomes. And uh, uh, when they call, when you call, they will ask you about questions about COVID 19, about whether anybody's sick. So be ready to answer those questions. And also, they will give you guidance on the phone about doing CPR. Even if you've never done it before, if you're wow. comfortable with it, wow. they will guide to you to do it. And uh, I've had some patients who had some, you know, good experience about it. But again, prevention is the key, you mm -hmm. know. So continue to take your medications, be alert of new symptoms, uh, and of course, you know, eat healthy. Try to maintain a little bit of exercise. I know we cannot go outside, it's very cold, or the gym, but these are all things that can prevent that emergency from occurring. Yeah, both really great shares there. And we can put up the um, AHA uh, uh, website information on our um, BCU Health Poly Heart Center page for more information on that. And um, yeah, Dr. Abate, that was a really good comment too with preventive. Um, if you listen to your body, listen to those signals of what's going on. So great addition there. So, um, and of course, eating healthy and, uh, and movement. Movement is medicine, right? Absolutely. Okay. All right. I think we have another question that came in too. Okay, if I recently had a stent put in, should I have should I take any additional precautions to keep me safe during this pandemic? Who wants to take that one? You want to go, Kay, or you want me to? Do? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, so when a stent put in, so someone with coronary disease, again goes back to that category of someone with higher risk, and I um, I think they, in addition to abiding from 
the precautions of social distancing, wearing a map, getting the vaccine when you have access to it. Um, outside of that, you know, being conscientious uh, of the people you're around, uh, you know, I, I think those exercising that within the realm of reason is, is, is what I'd advise any of my patients to do. Mm-hmm. I, I can't speak to anything beyond that. I, I, it is already, you know, I think we're all realistic about the challenges of, of living in these, in these, in this environment, in some of these confines already. But uh, I think that's very reasonable if you can achieve all of that with someone with a stent. Mm-hmm. Very good. Okay. And then we uh, had some questions to come in through the uh, Facebook comments. Yeah. So if we have mild asthma and get COVID, should we take steroids at home to prevent the second inflammatory stage of COVID? Great question. That is a fantastic question, actually. Yeah. So uh, let me let me take the asthma out of the of the equation for a minute and say you should not take steroids at home to prevent the second inflammatory stage of COVID because uh, it has been tested, and in patients with mild form of the disease. Those who have not progressed, steroids did not help. They did not prevent uh, the uh, the mortality associated with COVID nineteen. Uh, now we could we could discuss scientifically why that is the case. I don't think we would come to a definite answer. Uh, it may be that at that point the problem is with the virus rather than the inflammatory response. But we do know that steroids are not recommended, oral steroids are not recommended at home in patients who are not requiring oxygen therapy, who don't have a a serious enough COVID uh, disease, COVID-19 disease. Now, Mm. going back to asthma, that is, adds a little trick to that. Sometimes steroids are used to treat asthma. So if you are usually taking uh, steroids, either inhaled or oral, for an asthma exacerbation, you should talk with your doctor and you should take it. I mean, I guess I cannot recommend it without, you know, having evaluated your case, but there should be no reason to not take it if it's indicated for another reason. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. I'll add one more um, part to this. There is a, another anti-inflammatory drug, colchicine, that is used for gout that uh, has been brought up as a possible way to prevent transition to the secondary phase. A large study was conducted uh, in Canada and all over the world, including US, and the data was promising. The FDA has not made any comment on it yet. The CDC has not made any comment yet on it, Uh, but there could be ways to take an anti-inflammatory drug to prevent that. So colchicine may be the answer. The data seems Mm -hmm. promising. Uh, but again, we don't have official word from these uh, um, institutions yet. Great, yeah, terrific response. It was a lot to unpack in that question, and I, and I think you got it. You got it, and I hope the person who de- who answer, asked the question got with their response. So very Thank good. You. Okay. Oh, okay. So this is a great question. Does a patient with AFib, which uh, for the audience that's atrial fibrillation, does a patient with AFib fall in the heart failure category? So uh, AFib and heart failure are very intertwined. Um, Sometimes it's a sort of chicken or the egg conversation. AFib is an irregular heart rhythm that can sometimes be very rapid and cause heart failure. Mm -hmm. Heart failure itself or a weak heart or cardiomyopathy as we discussed can cause stress on the heart walls of the atria and force the atria or cause the atria to go into atrial fibrillation. So this is something to tease out um, for each individual patient. Uh, I don't think having just AFib, and sometimes we call this lone AFib, and this happens sometimes to younger patients, necessarily puts you into that very high risk category for that pie graph that I showed. Mm-hmm. Um, but but that being said, most patients who have AFib are older. Most patients that have AFib have other comorbidities, and those would push you in the higher risk category. 
So AFib alone is not going to help discriminate between who is low, medium, and high risk. That, thank you. Very good. Okay. Um, and we'll go to the, to the next question. Okay. So we have, can the monoclonal antibodies be used as a quasi-experimental vaccine? Is, and if so, <laughs> will we explore this route? Antonio? It's a wonderful question. We have a very uh, well-educated audience here. So the answer is uh, yes, it can be explored. And uh, there are trials going on uh, right now. I will tell you that we were part of a trial here at VCU that looked at, not as I said, a vaccine, but for family members of individuals that were uh, infected. So if you were, in, someone in family were infected, someone you lived with was infected, it doesn't have to be a family member, someone you, you were exposed to uh, regularly was infected and you were, did not have any symptoms, you could sign up for this study and receive this treatment to prevent the onset of the disease. They just announced the, the results, the preliminary results, and I think it was effective in 100% of cases, which is very promising. But they're not approved for this use at this time. They're probably undergoing uh, FDA review. And, uh, and so we're certainly exploring this. There has been other uh, uh, ideas of giving these antibodies periodically, every month or every two months, every three months, uh, in, in, in exchange for the vaccine. And um, the, the, the large clinical trials that included tens of thousands of patients haven't been completed yet. And so at this point, we're focusing on vaccination because we know that the vaccines work. You know, we already have two that are FDA approved. There's at least two that are very close to FDA approval and they're all looking very good. And so uh, they're probably we're probably going to go that route. There are some individuals who may not be candidates for vaccine or vaccine may not work. This could be explored as a strategy. So that was a very good question. Yeah, that's such a terrific question. So futuristic, you know, for, for where we are. So just great question. Okay. And so now we have, I think another vaccine related question. Yeah. How might heart related conditions react to the vaccines? Could yeah. you experience a more severe reaction following that second dose? Great question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe I can start and then Kayer can continue. I, I sure. recently did a little piece on this uh, for, the, um, for the Heart Center. And so uh, there is no reason to think that you're, you're going to have more adverse reaction to the vaccine just because you have a heart condition. So there is no reason to think of that. You should not be concerned to get the vaccine. Actually, you should be lining up to get it as soon as possible because you're going to get the more benefit. In terms of the reaction to the, to the vaccine, so uh, some the new data is coming out every day and is looking really, really good. So there are some mild reaction that are like pain. I had some pain on my left arm that radiated yeah. down the arm. It was a little more intense than the flu. I had to take some Tylenol. So that pain is, is occurring. Some patients, uh, some individuals are reporting feeling kind of tired under the weather for a day or two. Um, I've, I've heard of reports of a low grade fever. Uh, all of these can happen. When you look at the data from thousands and thousands of people, they were almost never severe. I mean, they were talking about a risk of one on probably 100,000 or something like this. Uh, mm -hmm. The concern about allergic reaction that has been brought up, it is possible, but incredibly rare, especially if you never had an allergic reaction before. But that's what, this is why you, you get the vaccine when there are medical professionals. And so if you had a reaction, you probably had it, have it in the next 15 minutes or so, and you'd mm -hmm. be treated. And, but again, it's coming out as being very rare, like something in one on 10,000 or, or, or close to that. And Kay, uh, I'd love to hear if you have something to add about heart failure patients specifically. No, we're certainly advocating that everybody get the vaccine. Um, you know, we are now hearing anecdotally, m most, many people have a sore arm afterwards. Um, we've, you know, I think everyone has a family member or a friend or someone, a friend of a friend that they've heard about that's felt like they've had the flu 
short-lived flu for a day or so. But um, I think there a lot of the concerns uh, with vaccinations, especially vaccinations after um, a, such a such a rapid approval process and, and clinical trial, um, have been set to the side. And uh, I think everybody I know that's a healthcare provider is advocating that their patients move forward with this. Um, we've not seen any any serious harm signal. Um, there were some talks of select patients who had had some mortalities in Europe early in the process, or much much older patients. And I'm not sure if there, Antonio, if there's any other information from that, or that was just you know data dust. Well, yeah. I th thank you for bringing that up. I think the yeah. you know different uh, nations have approached this in a different way. In some areas, they've started with treating over eighty years old in nursing homes, mm -hmm. and and so unfortunately, that is a population that has a high baseline risk, and so just you know <clears throat> things can happen, and uh, and so it, it may have just been play of chance that you know after the vaccination some of these patients may have died. I think in one nation, they went back and they said they saw that the year before they had, you know, even higher numbers of death in that time period. Um, one question that uh, usually comes up is, you know, what should I do with my um, antiplatelet or anticoagulants uh, mm -hmm. when do that? So there is no specific guidance from the FDA to do anything different with your anticoagulants. So what the only thing I would say is if you're on warfarin, Coumadin, and you, it would be mm -hmm. nice to, to know that your Coumadin is working uh, appropriately, you're not very high, because if you're very high, you could get a, a larger hematoma, you know, a larger uh, bruise in your arm, it could hurt mm -hmm. more. Uh, nothing that would be life-threatening, but it could be uh, uh, bothersome. But if you are taking medication for your stents, someone brought it up earlier, absolutely do not suspend them because that could be dangerous. If you're taking medication for your atrial fibrillation, uh, most of, I, there's no guidance of suspending, needed for suspending that. If you want to check with your doctor, uh, you can. Uh, sometimes suspending for a day or two may not be a big deal, but again, no, no direct recommendation to suspend it. Yeah. Yeah, terrific discussion on on that that question alone. I know um, from my circle, there's been um, different experiences from that second shot all across the board. It's just very individual. I do, can say my my arm was sore for a couple of days though. Um, okay, so this uh, next question, I think this uh, next question too might be our last question too. So, for elderly family members with heart related conditions but are afraid of getting COVID from clinic exposure. How can we help them understand why follow-up care is is more critical? This is Pauline. Yeah. I I tell you, if I had the skills, knowledge, or training on influencing a stubborn family member, <laughs> I'd be much more successful in life. So I, I'm going to pass it on to Antonio. Well, I, I would say let's let's start with uh, some things that we are doing for even the, those who are you know more refractory. We have you know ramped up our telehealth dramatically, right? So if you don't want to come in, uh, which I'll talk to you in a second why you you should come in, but if you don't want to come in, at least do a telehealth visit with your doctor, review yeah. your medication, get a blood pressure cuff at home. Uh, monitor your weight with a scale and things like this. And I think we've, you know, we ramped it up incredibly uh, well. And the day like today, there was a snow day. It worked perfectly. I did all my clinic from home today. Uh, but uh, for those who need to come in because they need to get their blood checked, they need to mm -hmm. have an exam that it cannot be done virtually. Um, you know, I, I, I sometimes make an argument that the hospital now is the safest place. Uh, that you're more likely to get it if you go to the grocery store somewhere somewhere else. In the hospital, um, you know, the great majority of uh, healthcare providers are vaccinated. Uh, you get screened when you come in. You get asked questions over and over again. Everybody's wearing a mask. We're, you know, strongly enforced. And we're not going to, you know, there's distancing in the waiting room. Uh, we try to keep the waiting uh, shorter because there's less people in person. And so I think you should not be afraid of coming in for procedures, labs, or tests. And if I had a family member, which I actually do, and I would think that you you as a younger person can go with that, that family member and mm -hmm. welcome through the path. We still allow one person in clinic to go with a, a family member who may need assistance or is afraid. Yeah. 
That, that's terrific. Just a really strong point to end on. You know, again, don't delay care. The hospital is very safe. You know, we have a lot of perimeters in place and um, a lot of our healthcare providers have been vaccinated and we are wearing those masks. So, and, and that virtual telemedicine is a great option too. So great share to you both. And Dr. Bate, Dr. Shaw, thank you both for, for joining us this evening. Um, thank you to our audience for joining us this evening and for having these terrific questions so we can have this discussion tonight. So um, really glad you were able to join us and um, to learn more about the threat of COVID-19 that poses those with heart-related issues. Um, and, and the way that you discuss those tools to help lower your risk and how the virus overall affects um, heart health. Just thank you again. Um, for more information about heart health and the Poly Heart Center, please visit vcuhealth.org forward slash heart. You can also follow us at VCU Health or at VCU Health Heart on Facebook. So again, thank you to Dr. Bate, Dr. Shaw. I'm giving you an applause here. I know that the, our virtual audience is cheering you on as well. And thank you all to our audience who joined us today. Have a great night, everybody. Stay thank safe. you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, Karen.